so we're going to get started here. Uh, if you'd like to turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, that's where we're going to get started. Luke chapter 15. Give you a second to get there and then uh, I'll pray and then we'll get started. Dear Jesus, thank you again for allowing us to come here on a Sunday, allowing us to have the freedoms in America to come, worship you any way we'd like. Thank you for giving us your word that we can uh, learn and uh, serve you better uh, from it. Just give us a, a good service and keep us safe. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 15 is uh, very familiar. Uh, passage we're going to read here, but if you go to verse number 11, it says, this is, uh, talking about Jesus, says, and he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me, and uh, he divided unto them his living. So the younger son came and asked the dad for the inheritance, and the dad actually, it says that he divided unto them his living, so the other brother got his living as well. Um, it's a little tidbit there. Okay, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Uh, when he had, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the, with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But, thy, but the father said to his, servant, to his servants, uh, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. Uh, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. We'll stop right there, but I just want to start off by making this statement, um, and we'll come back to it. And the statement is this, uh, uh, my, I love it, thing before the statement, sorry. My old, uh, one of my old teachers back in my, church in Michigan that I used to go to when I was a teenager, he made this statement. It stuck with me over all these years. And the statement, the statement is this, that God loves you in spite of you. God loves you in spite of you. He loves me in spite of me. And we'll get back to that, and that'll make sense a little bit later. But we see here that this uh, son did whatever he wanted to, uh, went out, spent his living, and lived a good life, and when it was all over and the hard times come, uh, he ran back to the father. To the father, and uh, <clears throat> we see that the father loved him in spite of him. Uh, let's go over to Galatians chapter five. I'm gonna get some water. Galatians chapter five. And we'll start out in verse 19. It says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, uh, lasciviousness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, uh, murders, uh, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before as... I have also told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So we see a contrast. There's a there's a fruit of the Spirit, and then there's the works of the flesh. Now, we have to establish uh, 
one thing to start off with. All of us before and after we get saved are sinners. There's no way around that. Uh, Adam and Eve, when they chose to reject everything that God had planned for them, everything that He had uh, built for them, if you go back to Genesis, the Bible says that God planted a garden in Eden okay, for them. Now, everything else, the Bible says that God spoke into existence. Now, I don't know if God could have planted you know, the garden just by speaking, but to me it sounds like God actually did some work there at the garden and he planted the trees and he took time to lay out everything that Adam and Eve would need uh, to live a, a good uh, luxurious life and uh, yet they rejected that for one thing that they couldn't have and from them all the way down generation to generation to generation to us were sinners. For as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. There's no way around it. Uh, before you're saved, after you're saved, you're a sinner. Okay? Now, for you, anybody that doesn't know, I'm talking about being saved, is when Jesus came and he died on the cross, paid for our sin debt. With us being sinners, there's a penalty for that sin, and that's death and hell. God can't allow sin into heaven, so... He sent His Son, and the Bible actually says that it pleased God to have Jesus uh, be beaten and crucified for us. It actually pleased God. Why? Well, He's being able to reconcile us back to Him. That's something that had to happen. No man could do that. It took God in the flesh to do that. And although it was a rough time and a... Uh, a horrible thing that Jesus had to go through it actually pleased God because he knew at the end of it he would get his son back but he'd also get many millions of people that would believe and trust he would be able to reconcile them as well um, <clears throat> so whenever I talk about being saved that's what I'm talking about putting your faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross um, that he paid the penalty for you and you're not trusting in anything other than what Jesus did so, uh, but we see that, and after we get saved, after we accept Jesus as our Savior, we still have flesh, and that's why we're still sinners. Not until Jesus comes back and we receive our new body uh, will we be able to um, get rid of this. Uh, obviously, when we die, our spirit's going to be um, in heaven, so we won't have the, the flesh to deal with then. But when uh, Jesus comes back, uh, our bodies are going to be transformed. We're not going to have to deal with this old flesh anymore. And we won't have the works of the flesh. But now we do. So now the works of the flesh are manifest. So, how do we uh, justify th these works of the flesh? Well, it's through grace. Or what Jesus did on the cross. The Bible says that um, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So, the works of the flesh are these, adultery, where adultery abounded, grace won. Where uncleanness abounds, grace always will win. If you choose grace, it will win. Where idolatry or witchcraft or hatred, where those abound, you choose grace, grace will much more abound. And you say, how can, how can that be? You know, I've... Sometimes you get to this point where you feel like you're so backslidden and uh, you don't know what to do and you don't believe that God loves you anymore. How could He? Out of the works of the flesh, you've just been feeding and feeding and feeding. How could God, a perfect, righteous God, love me after all that I've just done? And you think in yourself, well, grace much more abounds. If you just choose grace. So you say, I'm way too far gone for God to ever receive me again. What are you talking about? Well, <clears throat> the Bible says that if you draw an eye to God, that He will draw an eye to you. Now, I don't know about you, but I got short legs. <laughs> but I know God can hold the world in His hands. And He created all that there is. So that tells me he has really, really long legs. Now, if I draw an eye to God, he's drawn an eye to me. It's not the fact that 
I'm trying to run and run and run and run and take a billion steps to God. It's the fact that He's actually coming to me. Just like the prodigal son, it wasn't that he was running and running and running. It just says that as he went. Well, what did the father do? As soon as he saw him, he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. That's that's what, um, that's the place that we need to get to. Is say, yeah, I know that uh, everything that I've been doing, maybe I've still been fulfilling the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Yeah, maybe I've been doing some things that I shouldn't have been doing or whatever. And I'm thinking to myself that God doesn't love me anymore. Well, put that away. Remember that grace always wins, no matter what it is. Take that first step toward God, and He's going to take a step toward you. And His are much more, uh, He has much more length in His steps than we have in ours. So what I want to get to, get back to that statement, is that God loves us in spite of us. Now, what's the definition of love? What can we say? What actually is love? If God loves us in, in spite of us, we do all these bad things. Would it constitute as us doing the fruit of the Spirit? Does that is that the def, definition of love? Would it be? See, the world has a, a their own definition of love. You talk to people and. Um, I see a lot of my family members post stuff on Facebook too. They say, I'm done doing anything with that person because every time I try to love them, they just use me and throw me out and I'm just done with it. Well, some, you know, some people have their own definition of love and, uh, but what is the Bible definition of love? What is, what does God say that love is? If God loves us in spite of us, what does that actually mean? Well, maybe love is at 5.30 this morning when my daughter wakes up crying. <laughs> you go in and give her a big hug. Is that love? Maybe it's a couple that have been together for 40, 50 years. Is that love? Stayed together and uh, we're able to live with, live with each other and grow as uh, as one together. Maybe it's a wife that, although her husband might not uh, be doing things that she would even agree with, and yet she still cleans the house and takes care of the, the kids, would that be love? Well, the Bible says that Greater love hath no man than this, not a man lay down his life for his friends. But yet God loved us so much that while we were his enemies, he laid down his life for us. So God has the ultimate love. We can only love so much to the point where we can lay down our lives to our friends that's the greatest love that God tells us, and yet we were his enemies and he laid down his life for us. That's what God loves us in spite of us really means. You could be a, a drunken, backslidden Christian, doing whatever you want, living in the world. God loves you anyway. You could be a Christian, come to church every Sunday. God loves you. You could be uh, a pathological liar out in the world deceiving everybody that you come across and yet God loves you anyway. You see, Pastor talked about it this morning about how for God so loved the world. There's no conditions on God's love. He doesn't say you have to come to church every Sunday and read your Bible every day and pray to me an hour every day and set up a hundred thousand things that you have to do to earn His love. No, if you were born, God loves you. 
if you turn out to be uh, the most wicked person in the world, God loves you anyway. Now, that doesn't mean that the things that you do won't have consequences, because they will. That's just the laws of nature. That's the way God set up the world. You do right, God's going to protect you. He's going to have His hand on you. But as, as you stray and do your own thing, well, you can't really count on the protection of God's hand uh, too often. That's like, here recently, our daughter has been... I don't know. I don't know what happened. She's just been throwing fits, talking back to people, yelling at people. I don't know what happened. You know, uh, a couple months ago, she would say, yes, ma'am, thank you. And <laughs> the corner has obviously turned. Uh, she turned the corner on that one. But uh, do I love her any less? No. But... When she asked for a cookie today, I didn't give her one. Okay. But I'll still protect her as her father. I'm not going to let her stray to the point where she's going to hurt herself down down the line. I'm not going to let her get to the point where she'll just continually uh, do that same thing and talk back to people, talk back to people, and throw fits. Because I know one day she might have a boss. One day she might have a husband and kids to raise and she's going to want to be a good example so <clears throat> I don't love her any less but sometimes there will be times where I'm going to say no but as long as she's going to come back to me if she takes that step I'm going to take a step toward her She, even though today I told her she couldn't have a cookie if she starts obeying me immediately you know today then I'll be more apt to give her a cookie later on, today even. And that's, you know, that's a very small, minuscule example of, of God's love for us uh, and the fact that He loves us in spite of us. We, we were the ones that uh, put Jesus on the cross. Obviously, it was His choice to go to the cross and pay our sin debt. But without sin, He wouldn't have had to. If Adam and Eve would have just did what they were supposed to, and you know that Adam and Eve every day had the privilege and opportunity in the cool of the day to walk with God Himself. You know, God affords us that same opportunity through the Holy Spirit living inside of us if you're saved. And yet, so many times we reject Him and do our own thing. But God loves us in spite of us. So Adam and Eve, they rejected Him. And through that, it was our sin that put Jesus on the cross. We were the ones that were standing around shouting, crucify Him. And yet, He loves us anyway. He loves us in spite of us. No matter what we've done, no matter how far you've gone, don't believe that you're too far away. You're just one step away. Draw an eye to God, and He'll draw an eye to you. You're just one altar call away from surrender. You're just one step away from God's grace again. My daughter is just one thank you away from having a cookie. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, remind all of us that it was a, I mean, the message almost ties in with this morning about if, if it weren't for God, where would we be? Uh, and it's basically the same thing. Uh, without God, we wouldn't be able to go to heaven. We wouldn't be able to live abundantly here on earth but just a reminder that although we are sinners although that we do whatever we want to do whenever we want to do it God loves us anyway he wants us to come back to him just like the prodigal son came back to his father sometimes 
It's going to take a really, really rough patch in our lives. But why do we need to get to that point? Why can't we just come back now? Why can't we just realize that God loves us and take that step toward Him before the bad times come, before the famine hits and we're feeding with the swine? Just a reminder that God loves us no matter what.